Hello, everyone. Hope we're all doing wonderfully today. Um, if you're coming in from the JavaScript Bootcamp, hello again. Sorry to leave in a rush. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Everybody coming in from lots of different places and from around the world. You got folks from the Netherlands, from Cameroon, um, from Spain. Ah, I'm so excited to see you all. And I'm so excited that we're here to have this session today. I am, it is my distinct honor to bring on Stuart. I'm going to bring on Stuart in just a sec. And you're live, Stuart. Hello there. Hello, people. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Stuart. This is so exciting. I'm very excited, if I may, to just gush over you for just a bit, if I may. <laughs> um, Stuart here, you're tuning in from Birmingham, the UK. Is that correct? I am, yes. And Stuart here is a wonderful strategist in all things web, developer, and consultant. And I'm so excited to have you here. And you're here to bring on a topic. I was talking to the folks in the JavaScript bootcamp a little bit before um, about why we don't need as much JavaScript as we think we do. And some of the folks correctly joked around like, wait, are we doing the right bootcamp here? And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be wonderful. I'd, I'd love to give you an opportunity to preface a little bit about what you're going to tell us about. Okay. So um, the title of this talk is you don't really need all that JavaScript, I promise. And the intention here is to give you all of you listening the sense of how to understand some of the arguments you might hear made out there in the world in the web development community in the web development industry and part of you doing this boot camp is giving you a firm foundation for uh becoming part of the industry for knowing actually what you're doing and this will hopefully give you some more um, some more tools along those lines to give you a sense of what's really important about what the web, what you might want to push back on, uh, and honestly, a bit of insight into what it's like from someone who's been doing this a while. Sounds wonderful. I can't wait. I'm going to hop off stage. I'll be here. We'll do a Q&A at the end, folks. Stuart, the stage is yours. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Um, Obviously, if people, if you have questions, do feel free to um, enter them in wherever it is you're watching this. That's absolutely fine. Um, we'll probably pick them up at the end, I believe. Um, we have um, Jess and Ramon moderating. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else moderating. If there is, do please shout and I'll call you out. Um, so, yes, just do feel free to go ahead and ask questions, whatever we'll, we'll do with that. Um, so, I believe some of you have come from... Um, uh, HTML, CSS, bootcamp, some of you from all the JavaScript end. Um, but I suspect all of you know that the web is made up of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. But most of our page is the HTML. And most of the web is the pages. You need the words and the pictures, the content, more than you need the colors and the buttons. That's why people uh, in general are hopefully taught HTML first as the structure, then CSS, then JavaScript. Structure, display, behavior. Some people are taught this the wrong way around. <laughs> they're, they're taught JavaScript first, or at least they reach for JavaScript first when they're building the web. And every now and again, this ends up with JavaScript just entirely and completely taking over, which is not necessarily what we want. But the goal, the three are designed to be in balance, three legs on which the modern web sits. If you let JavaScript lead, then it does have a bit of a habit of taking over. And it's worth looking at why this might not actually be a great idea. So Zach Leatherman is... Um, uh, web developer, and he's the principal behind the Eleventy project, which is a static site generator for those of you who may have come across that. And he's been looking into performance. And one of the things he wanted to test was how much of a performance impact it had to uh, add a bunch of JavaScript components to a particular site. This is as part of um, his general work on the web and as part of his work with Eleventy. And so he wanted to test a uh, those of you who have done some JavaScript or those of you who are entering the industry may have heard about React. And what he wanted to do was test a, a site built on React, so client-rendered, a React-based React website, which displayed one of his tweets. 
and then compare that against a plain HTML file. No JavaScript whatsoever, just a plain HTML file displaying a tweet and get a sense of what the performance impact will be. Obviously, there will be some, but there are also benefits to using a web component or React component to, to render this kind of thing. Uh, but he wanted to get a sense of what the trade-off would be, what the um, performance impact would be. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. He tested a React site rendering a single tweet against an HTML file containing every single one of his tweets, all 27,000 of them, eight and a half megabytes of HTML. So the question was, you've got a React website rendering one tweet or an HTML file rendering 27,000 tweets, which is faster. And the very fact that I have this in this talk will probably tell you what the answer is. And Zach says here, which has a better first meaningful paint time? So this is the amount of time that the browser takes to put something relevant on the screen. There's a raw eight and a half meg HTML file with the full text of all 27,000 tweets or a client reacted, client rendered, sorry, react site with exactly one tweet on it. And the HTML wins by 200 milliseconds. It's faster to render all 27,000 tweets <laughs> than it is to render one if you're going to do it with a framework. Let's pick another example. So code highlighting. This is um, uh, most of you will have seen, I imagine, syntax highlighting. When you're using a text editor, uh, it will highlight different parts of the, um, the programming language in different colors to make it clearer what's what. So if you're doing HTML, then it might highlight um, tags, element names in one color and attributes in another and the text in a third and so on. And this is done by text editors, but there are also a number of different libraries and so on to do this for text to be rendered as HTML. So Remy Sharp, who is uh, the principal behind Left Logic, he runs FFConf here in the UK, the cool guy. Um, he um, he was looking into doing syntax highlighting on both the server and on the client. So one way you on your server you take some uh, you know, a block of programming code and you want to highlight it and then serve up HTML with the coloring baked into it. And the other way, you send the, the text and a JavaScript highlighting library to the client and then the JavaScript on the client side goes ahead and does the highlighting. So you're serving up plain HTML and a JavaScript function. And what Remy discovered is that when you're doing SSR, this is server-side rendering, doing all this stuff on the server, sending pre-rendered HTML, even though you're sending quite a lot more HTML because all the colors are baked into it, the total size of the stuff you're sending is smaller because you didn't have to send the JavaScript files to do the syntax highlighting. It's prism.js is what it was using. And it explicitly says there's practically zero impact on passing time. So you're serving twice as much HTML but it makes almost no difference. The browser is spectacularly, ridiculously fast at rendering HTML, at turning uh, a page of HTML into a displayed thing on the screen. As you saw with Zach's example, you can serve nine megabytes of data. And yeah, that might take a long time to download on a slow collection, on a slow connection. But there's almost no time taken by the browser to actually display that text. It is quite tempting to outsource a bunch of the work that your web service, your website, your web app has to do. Because if you do it on your server, you have to pay for that and you have to wait for that. And the idea is that if you push that out, so instead of you doing the work, you just push out data and JavaScript, which does the work, then the JavaScript runs on the user's computer. So instead of you paying for the server, you're essentially outsourcing this work to the world's largest distributed supercomputer, which is the web as a whole. But if you do that, the work doesn't go away. You're just making everyone else do it instead of you. And importantly, you only have to do it once. And the client does it once per user that you have. So you're doing a lot more work. And in total, at least you specifically are not doing a lot more work, but the world is doing a lot more work. It's using a lot more energy. It's affecting a lot more performance. And importantly, 
the computers they're doing it on, probably their phones, are probably not as good as the computer that you'd be doing it on your server. Phones are mostly rubbish and slow, right? Um, this is Alex Russell, who used to work for Google on Chrome and now works for Microsoft on the Edge team. And he says, the takeaway here is that you literally can't afford desktop or iPhone levels of JavaScript if you're trying to make good web experiences for anyone but the world's richest users. If you are looking at the web on an iPhone with fast Wi-Fi, the experience you're getting is radically different from most people. And it unfortunately affects the way you tend to think about these things. It's very useful for people who are in that environment to see what normal people <laughs> see. I'm guilty of this myself. I'm a web developer. I've got fast Wi-Fi. I've got an iPhone. Hooray. So everything feels very fast, very snappy to me. And you forget that it's not like this. You can't rely on this kind of thing. And this is the point that Alex was trying to make here. And quite a few people will say, well, then just serve less JavaScript and then everything works fast. That's what I'll do. Um, so instead of serving a huge JavaScript library, if we put effort into making sure that we only serve the bits of JavaScript we need, everything's fast because we serve less stuff. Unfortunately, you have a willing partner in this, which is the network, because networks all hate you and they want you to suffer. Right? Anytime you have to deal with anything which is network related at some point, it's going to turn around and bite you. And it's very frustrating because what we're talking about here for real is availability. Some of you may have seen this statistic. If you're building a website and it's using JavaScript to enhance the site, you may have seen the statistic that 1.1% 1, 1 .1 of people are not getting the JavaScript enhancements. This is from GDS, who are the government digital service here in the UK. And... A lot of people, they hear this statistic and they think, well, okay, I mean, obviously that's a problem and we care about that. We don't want to cut out 1% of our audience. But equally, you know, we've got a lot to do and the backlog's quite long and it's only 1%. It's only one in 100 people. And they're probably not our target audience anyway. Obviously, we have to prioritize. Do we deliver um, more features to the majority of people or every feature to everybody, which massively slows us down. It's lots of effort to make our web app available to absolutely everybody. And maybe as a business decision, we'll take it's not worth it. So we're just going to have to say, sorry, you need this level of browser to use this, or um, you need this faster connection to use this. You need this mobile phone to use this. We don't support this version of Android, this version of iOS, this version of Windows. We've got priorities, we've got a backlog, maybe we'll do it next time. Sorry, that 1%, but we're going to have to leave you behind. But, and this is the important point, when they say 1% of people didn't get your JavaScript, it's not like this. Continuing that thing from GDS, from the Government Digital Service, the proportion of people who have explicitly disabled JavaScript or who use a browser that doesn't support JavaScript only make up a small slice of people that don't run JavaScript. Most of the people who didn't run the scripting on your website should have run it. They haven't turned it off. They aren't using a browser that doesn't support it. Everything should have worked, and it didn't anyway. And there are lots of reasons why JavaScript might not work. This is a website which lists a bunch of them. But you've got things like, are they behind a corporate firewall? Are they in... Uh, if those of you who've um, who've tried to use Wi-Fi in a hotel or an airport will no doubt be aware of the catastrophic misery that such situations can cause. Um, are you using Chrome's data saver mode uh, in order to save data because you've got an expensive data plan? Well, that will disable all the scripting. Do they have add-ons or plugins in their browser which interfere with your JavaScript, which you didn't test with, test with possibly because you don't even know they existed? Is the the are they serving their um, their stuff from a CDN from a central um, from a content delivery network, and is that up or has it crashed or gone down in the interim? There are lots and lots of different reasons why your JavaScript might not work for a particular user on this particular time. The network goes down. They're on a train and they go into a tunnel. You know. Um, We've had examples all over the world of uh, ISPs, internet service providers, deliberately blocking JavaScript. So Sky, um, 
uh, Sky here in the UK, blocked jQuery, the library. Anyone using jQuery, their site just didn't work. And there's nothing you could have done about that as a user. If you were a customer of Sky's, then suddenly all the websites that use jQuery don't work. Uh, Comcast in the United States inserted adverts into people's web pages, which broke a whole ton of their scripting. And what this actually means is that it's like this. It's not 1% of people who always can't see your website and 99% of people who always can. It's 1% of visits. So someone shows up and it works, and then the next time it works, and the next time it works, and the following time it doesn't work, and then it works again the next time. So the people who aren't seeing the scripting on your site, they aren't browsing on a phone from 2001. Um, that they, they're you in a, a cellar bar or in a hotel room or on the train or waiting for the phone network to wake back up or worse it's like this imagine if you show up to a site and it doesn't work a couple of times two or three or four times then the fourth time you say i don't think this website works um i'm going to go away i'm going to use the native app instead or i'm going to go and use the competition because their website seems to work and that's what you've got to concern about us as we are developers we understand how this stuff works so you understand the distinction between this didn't work because the network failed this didn't work because the browser failed and this didn't work because the website itself failed but most people don't and should not have to understand this any failure for any reason impacts on you as the developer of the site that they're looking at because everyone will blame the site that they're looking at and so even if the network lets you down, you are the ones who will feel an impact. The users will trust you a little bit less, even though it's not your fault at all. So you have to be a little bit defensive about this. You have to anticipate that that might happen and deal with it anyway. And one way of doing that is not by being completely reliant on your JavaScript working. But leaving all that aside, leaving aside the idea that um, performance is impacted, leaving aside the idea that your site might break if you're scripting dependent the most important thing i think about the modern web is that it's unnecessarily difficult to use unnecessarily difficult to develop for if you look at a list of all the technologies that you're supposed to understand that people will throw around willy-nilly that are touted as a critical thing that web developers need to understand and if you don't understand them you're somehow failing as a web developer I can't even, I don't know what half the stuff on this list is. And it's not just me saying this, lest you think that I'm a crotchety old man who complains about this stuff. And to be clear, that is the truth. And I am a crotchety old man who complains about this stuff, but it's not just me. So this is uh, Drew McClellan. And he says, increasingly, there seems to be a sense of fatigue within our industry. Just when you think you've got a handle on whatever the latest tool or technology is, something new comes out to replace it. And Owen Williams, I've discovered how many others are feeling similarly overwhelmed by the choices we have as modern developers. And Garrett Demon is talking about um, tools that you may have come across or may have mentioned SAS and JavaScript dialects and NPM and building tools solve some shortcomings with front end, te front -end technologies. But at what cost? For every hour these new technologies have saved me, they've cost me another hour in troubleshooting or upgrading the tool. In the meantime, I could have broken out any text editor and built a full site with plain HTML and CSS in the time it took me to get it all running, and the site would have been easier to maintain in the long run. So in the time it takes you to set up all the complicated tools that you're told you need to use, you could have just built the site in the first place. This is um, Rachel Andrew. Here it says, I can still take a complete beginner, teach them to build a simple web page with HTML and CSS in a day. We don't need to talk about tools. Or frameworks just need a text editor and a few hours this is how we make things show up on a web page and i'm not trying to overwhelm you here with similar quotations the point is the thing that i want to get across is these are all notable smart motivated people who work professionally on the web and with the web and for the web these people who are dedicated to the idea of what the web is their teachers and their public speakers and their professional web developers, and they're feeling overwhelmed by the complexity of it. If 
you find yourself looking at the uh, industry that you're uh, that you're part of and thinking, "Wow, this is so complicated. I I don't understand it." Don't think that everyone else does understand it and you're falling behind because you they don't and you aren't. This is confusing for basically everybody, um, me included, professionals included, professionals who've been doing this for decades included. Don't listen to people who tell you that understanding this stuff is important or that you even need to be on board at all. This, this is a link. This is how you go from one page to another page. This is how you show some different content on the page. Now, I mean, you can do it this way. You can um, you can build a bunch of JavaScript, which handles a click on the page and then takes the data away and puts new data in place. But don't do this. Use HTML when you can. The whole point of HTML is that it does most of the heavy lifting for you. Now, it doesn't do everything. And when you can't use it, well, we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk about why it's like this why do we do all this Let's take a step back there are reasons and honestly they're good reasons um it does occasionally feel in in web development as well as in other areas of your life that when things go wrong it's because someone maliciously came up with a way of making your life difficult because they think it's fun i promise you it's not really like that everyone who's out there building um uh, new JavaScript frameworks or new component libraries. They're doing so because they're trying to solve a real problem. They see this problem, they see their solution as being a good thing for this problem, and they've made that available to you because they hope it will solve your problem as well. They are attempting to do the right thing, and that is good. But what we're also seeing is people consider the individual problem they're trying to solve, but not the totality of all problems, which is that every new library, every new component, every new framework, every new article about things that you're expected to learn may solve an individual problem, but they also add to the complexity of web development as a whole. And that's no individual person's responsibility to fix. The reasons they are attempting to fix this are things like component reuse, where when I build a thing, I I want to give it to other people so they can use it too, so they don't have to solve the same problem that I did. Or when someone else solves a thing, I don't have to solve, solve the same problem they did. That makes me able to build things faster. It makes me able to take on someone else's work, and that's a good thing. It means we can build up libraries of existing code, either on GitHub or on the web in general, or inside your company, uh, components and tools that you want to use again and again. Um, it means you have a you can have a consistent starting point for projects, so that you gradually build up over time the way you think projects should work, and you include that in every project. And you might want to impose some sense of organizational structure on. The work that you're doing and this is important if you work for a very big organization where you might have tens or hundreds or possibly even thousands of people working on a particular website or web property you need to be able to impose some structure on it so two different people can work on the same thing at the same time without stepping on one another's toes you can work on related things without stepping on one another's toes and so on it allows you to embody best practices to put best practice into the code you're doing if you want to enforce coding standards for example all of these tools give you ways of doing that they're not built to get in your way but i think these are all after the fact rationalization nobody sat down and said well what we want is component reuse and we want uh, best practices and we want libraries of existing code what should we create how should we design web tooling to get those things we built the web tooling first and then after the fact said, given that we've built all these frameworks, what do we get out of them? And the answer is all that stuff I just listed. But I think the reason people started inventing client-side frameworks is this. In the old days, when you clicked on a link, the web browser, the page went white, disappeared. And then the new page started loading off the network and then it loaded in bit by bit chink, 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 down the page. And what that actually meant was a loss of control. We as developers, it's important that we concentrate on the user experience, the people who are using our website, 
uh, our web service, the experience they're getting. And anytime they're looking at a page that we built, that we designed, we have control over that user experience. But if you click on a link, you lose that control because the browser takes it over while the new page is loading. And so there, there was a bias against doing page loads, basically, because they meant a loss of our control as developers over the user experience. We don't like giving up control, and we're right to not want to give up control, right? The, the user experience is important, and our designers should be in charge of it. So if you think page loads are bad, then you say to yourself, well, what if, instead of having a browser load the new HTML page, what if I were to do that? So what I will do is I will go and fetch the new page off of the server myself. And then when I've got it all and I'm ready, I can switch the old page for the new page. No problem at all. And then I don't lose any control. It's all under my control when that switch happens and how that switch happens. And then someone says, oh, but that's quite inefficient because quite often when you move from one page to the next, a lot of the content is shared, the header, the footer, a sidebar, uh, the fonts that you're using, the styles that you're using are quite often the same. And it seems wasteful to load a whole page and then switch out one whole page for one other whole page when you only really needed to change some parts. And so what if we only changed the bits that had changed rather than changing everything? And so you invent, um, and those of you who have done some work with frameworks will know about this, the virtual DOM, which is a way of comparing the page that you're looking at and a page that you've got in your head and only changing the minimum amount required to turn one into the other. And then you say, oh, but what we did was we loaded a page ourselves, and then we changed it so using the virtual DOM to only change to make that change efficiently, to only change the bits that are important. But the URL has changed and that hasn't actually showed up. So you invent client-side routing where we are able to make a change to the page without actually navigating somewhere different, but then change the URL so it looks like we navigated somewhere different. And at that point, you are a framework. You have invented all of this stuff, but what you've actually done is you've reinvented the browser inside the browser. You've decided to implement uh, downloading new pages, rendering them on the screen, making changes to the, the DOM, the document object model, the thing which is displayed, um, changing the URLs. You've reinvented the browser inside the browser, all kind of based around the fact that we don't like page loads. Most of the time, you only really want to add some sprinkles of interactivity to an existing page. The majority of websites aren't, and they don't need to be single page applications. And importantly, that that I've just said, that's not me saying that, that's React saying that. That's a direct quote from React's own website. The idea is that, um, Frameworks are meant for building components, things that slot into existing website. They're not meant to replace the existing website. React themselves say React has been designed from the start for gradual adoption, and you can use as little or as much React as you need. So the principle here is to build components. You, you essentially replace um, or add new HTML elements to your HTML which are things that you get to implement to work how they like. And that's how components work generally, whether that's React or whether that's uh, building web components or you're building Svelte components or whichever framework you happen to like. That's how they're meant to work. But the idea that everything that's displayed is just a one component inside another, inside another, inside another, wasn't really the original goal. As I say, you want to add some sprinkles of interactivity to an existing page. That's what React say. The majority of websites aren't and don't need to be single page apps. So this is a page which uses view components as an example. This is a um, view status indicator, which is a, a, an existing view component. And it's it's very simple. You know, I, I'm not trying to demonstrate anything complicated. The little dots are a view component. And the idea is that they will show you the status of something, whether it's, um, you know, good, bad or indifferent. And the code, as you can see, the code is HTML, that's a perfectly ordinary HTML table, and you're just using status indicator as a component, but it just works like an HTML element, a new one. You're not starting off by 
generating a huge load of JavaScript and never looking at HTML. You're not JavaScript first. You're HTML first. Design the pages to do what you want and then add components to them, which add the extra interactivity, the extra uh, abilities that your site needs. But it's very much a write the HTML and then augment it rather than write a bunch of JavaScript, which incidentally generates HTML possibly, but you're not paying attention to it. And part of the reason for this is that HTML is quite a lot smarter than it used to be. HTML on its own does a lot of stuff now that used to have to be built by hand as components. And this is, I've got to think of a way of putting this, which isn't going to annoy a whole load of people in the industry. So maybe just don't tell them that I said this. But there are quite a lot of people who are in the web development industry and have been for a little while. And they will remember days when HTML was not as smart as this, when HTML could not do a lot of things that people wanted for websites. And so you had to build all this stuff as components yourself. You couldn't rely on HTML to do it for you. And so they learned to develop these things as JavaScript and take a kind of JavaScript first mentality because you had to. Now you don't, but they may not have necessarily picked up on the fact that HTML continued to develop. So, I mean, so a bunch of um, trivial examples, things like if you've got um, a, uh, a text box where you want to enter something, and any, if any of you have done desktop development, there's quite often a component, a thing available there where you've got um, something you can type into a text box, but it will also show you uh, a drop-down list of possible options. So you can choose one of the options or type in your own thing. And HTML didn't have this for years and years and years and years and years. Um, but it now does. So you've now got um, a, a, a text box that you can write into, and it will also give you options that you can choose between. And... Again, as I said, this, this is a trivial example. Another trivial example is um, that you can now enable and disable whole swathes of uh, form yourself based on which parts are relevant, which parts don't need to be filled in. But that's done in pure HTML with a disabled attribute, which is built in. It's part of HTML. If you're building a carousel, those of you who've done um, work displaying photos or sequences of things where one picture moves in and then the next picture moves in and then the next picture moves in and so on. Um, this used to be something that you had to build entirely with JavaScript, but now, if I don't this in the middle, it scrolls down to the next thing. It scrolls down to the next thing. So I let go here, it automatically scrolls to the next image. So a lot of the work you had to do to re-implement how the browser lays all this sort of stuff out is now built in. That's it's called scroll step, part of CSS. And it's not that it, these are, again, obvious, obviously trivial examples. Um, it's not that they're super revolutionary. It's that each of these things would have required a bunch of JavaScript enhancement, and now they don't. But, and I don't want you to get the wrong idea here, I am not for a moment saying to not use JavaScript. Um, this is Anna Chidor, and she says, just because you don't understand a simple CSS solution, it doesn't mean it's weird or crazy. And that goes the other way as well. Don't build something in pure CSS and make it much more complicated for yourself when you can just reach for JavaScript to do it. Be sensible. I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. I love JavaScript. It's great. It's programming language of the web. I've written books about it. I've been talking about it for years. I love it. Don't avoid it. Just don't necessarily let it run everything. It's a tool in your toolbox. It's not the only tool in your toolbox. It's good to stay in touch with the latest tricks, the latest things that are going on. We're in a fast-moving industry. Even by the standards of fast-moving industries, the web is a fast-moving industry. And it is. It's both good and important, I think, to stay in touch with some of the latest stuff that's going on. Even if you're not using it, just to vaguely know it exists. But stay in touch with all of the things that are relevant to your job. When you go on to um, to build things, to uh, to work on things, to work in this industry, or to uh, build the things that you want to do, remember to use all the tools and stay in touch with all the tools that are relevant to your job. That's HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Or don't. <laughs> this is uh, Flacky. 
And he's, uh, they say, um, not knowing stuff is normal. Not using new and shiny tech is okay. Feeling bad for all these is common, but you are not alone, but you are fine. Don't think to yourself that you don't understand this and everyone else does. The web is huge and, oh, well, web development is huge and complicated. And you don't have to stay in touch with it all. Understand the parts that you need and you'll be good. Fight the right fight. Don't fight against the web is what, essentially what I'm saying. There's, there's so much in our industry and in the rest of the world that needs fighting. There's so many ways we need to stand in solidarity with one another and with the web. There's so many people who need our help. There's so much good we can do. If you want to fight, great, but don't fight the web. Frameworks are a great thing to prototype stuff before it becomes part of the web platform. And part of the reason for that is things becoming part of the web platform takes a long time. It takes a long time to standardize things. And that's because when something becomes part of the web platform, you know that it's available to everybody. It's accessible. It's performance is good. It's been thought through in all situations. And that does take a long time. And that means that you can steal a march on that. You can get ahead of the game by building something yourself, building a component that the web doesn't currently provide because that's what you need for the thing that you're building. And great, that's what our frameworks are for. They allow you to build components that add to the web platform as it currently stands. And brilliant, go ahead and do that if that's what you need. Use extra stuff if it's not in the web platform yet. But every now and again, step back and ask yourself, is everything I'm doing not in the web platform? If you find yourself reaching for JavaScript again and again and again and again and again, as every component that you build, that everything you do is a custom developed component. Ask yourself, is that really right? Are you honestly on the bleeding edge all the time to make a login form, really? It's valuable what we do as an industry. We've got the power to bring knowledge to the whole world. We connect people together when they want us to. We're, we're building, making available the greatest repository of information the world has ever known. That's what the web is for. Let's keep it that way, all of us. Thank you very much. Stuart, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank I you. feel reinvigorated to to do. <laughs> I, I I I and I'd never heard of some of those uh, HTML elements before, so that was amazing. Thank you. That part part of the thing is, yeah, and I, I myself am guilty of this. That you think, oh. Um, I uh, I need to build this thing. And then don't keep up to date with the fact that HTML can do this now. And then someone says, but you know, you know, this is a very, uh, really, wow, I had no idea. Um, because people, uh, and as I say, myself included, tend to stay, tend to do quite a good job of staying in touch with the, the latest trends in framework development without realizing that HTML did not stop being developed in 2010. <laughs> I promise it didn't. People work on this stuff all the time. Yeah. This I is something that I've found as well. I'm rid of my screen, shouldn't I? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Let's. Yeah, let me, there we go. Great. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, Do you I, mind if I... Sorry, I've been hiding backstage. Hello. Hey, Jess. I thought since we've got a representation for a representative from JavaScript, I thought I'd come in and, and be the HTML folks. Wonderful. And that we could both aggressively ask you questions from our learners. Uh, sure. Go for it. And I know that you're going to be really disappointed by this because you thought, oh, it's going to be a bit controversial. I'm going to tell them to use less JavaScript. And unfortunately, fortunately, everybody's just being lovely where they're like, oh, thank you. Um, oh, you sound so smart. Oh, isn't he handsome? Just, you know, what you get <laughs> as you walk around your daily life. More of that. Well, um, yeah, that's absolutely what I get every day, honestly. Comments like that <laughs> the whole time. Um, but I mean, that's, obviously be enormously gratifying if, if if everyone is um if everyone listened to that and went yeah we just kind of agree and we already knew all that then that's <laughs> fantastic i'm very much like the world to exist this way and honestly um i don't know that i should necessarily say this but 
I think this is something where um, a lot of what I'm talking about might be better learned by people who are already in the industry rather than people who are necessarily joining. Because if you're joining this, you're um, if you're coming into the industry, you're coming in with fresh eyes. You're not kind of jaded by the way things were five or six or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. You you have the chance to look at this stuff and go, okay, what is important here? What isn't? And you're not necessarily being uh, fooled by those who claim they're trying to give you good advice and really they've got a product to sell you or an ethos to sell you uh, or an ideology to sell you. So this is going to be strange. Like we've invited you as an expert and I'm going to disagree with you. So you're saying, well, you know, maybe this, yeah, yeah, let's fight. And Stuart and I live in the same town. So as soon as we log off, we are going to go actually fight. Um, (laughs) I I think I might politely and gently and lovingly disagree with you because you're saying maybe this talk is more useful for folks in the industry. And one of the big reasons I was really excited to have you coming is that for learners, there's this big you need to learn React or you're not doing the web. You'd, and we've got folks saying it right now. So by, uh, by, Banigo is saying, you know, React is a lot. And MT is saying, well, thank you, Stuart. So polite. These learners are so, it's, it's unnecessary. They're the best. And they're saying JavaScript isn't everything. And that's what a lot of people, especially when they first start up, hear again and again and again is, do I need to learn JavaScript? You must have JavaScript. And even more, you must have React in order to be a real web mm. developer. And I don't I don't think that's true. And I love you. It's nice to have. It's nice to learn these things. And I love you coming to say, oh, hey, as you're getting started, it's okay. That's, that, that's very much the message I, I would like people to go away with is, you will hear a whole bunch of people who will tell you, um, no, 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 I mean, um, you obviously you should be building everything. The, 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 the first tool you should reach for is create React app. That's the, literally the first thing you do when you want to put anything on the web, create um, a single page application and start doing it. And it's more than that. It's not just we expect you to do this or you are expected to do this. There'll be subtle denigrations of not doing it that way so you'll hear people say oh yeah it used to be like that but now we're modern web developers do not be fooled (laughs) um and i hope i'm not taking up too much of your time but you're just have been between you and ramon just the loveliest on on air effect and you briefly mentioned oh gosh and you know if the learners have any questions at all come on and let us know in the chat you can ask us questions about Stuart's talk or you can hit him with the most is this fair uh obscure and squiggly javascript questions you can think of they're gentle they won't hurt you i mean you know go for Um, no no promises um i was gonna ask and this might be a philosophical question for learners who haven't really grappled with the idea of a web app where would we put Mm. that line between what's a web page and what's a web app? Is that a philosophical difference between I see this as a series of fixed documents or do you have sort of a a definition in your soul? I don't have a definition in my soul. Um, I think everyone would agree. So Adobe, for example, have very, very recently made Photoshop, full on proper Photoshop available on the web. as what? a Yeah. It's very impressive. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, it's it, it's an amazing technological achievement. It's built it, it's built with real native web components, um, not with React or with uh, Vue or whatever. But th- th- essentially, this is just another component library. It's just one that's built into the web platform. But this is obviously, if you're going to deliver Photoshop on the web, this is full board JavaScript required stuff. I am okay with that. No one is suggesting. You should build Photoshop by clicking on links and taking you to other pages. I mean, I'm um, suggesting it. That sounds that sounds like an art project. I feel like that would be a less efficient way of doing graphics. I'm not a graphics person, <laughs> but um, however, um, obviously at the other end of the scale, there is uh, something like an academic paper where it's one page um, and you just read through it and there's no interactivity at all. And one of those is obviously a web page and the other one's obviously a web app. But there is no obvious distinction. There is no obvious dividing line between the two. And almost always, 
the reason people use the phrase web app is, is because it's a way of attempting to claim that no, the thing I'm building is a web app, not a website, and therefore I don't have to do all the things that websites need, like be accessible to people. <laughs> um, it's yes, using um, using the phrase web app in my experience is an attempt to avoid your responsibilities as a web developer by claiming I'm building apps. I just happened to deliver them through a web browser. And this is disingenuous at best, in my opinion. Mm. So we've got sort of some less of a question than a comment, which I know you've heard from your conferences, but these are, these are good ones. These are gentle ones. And I, of course, I never have an agenda, but I kind of want to see if you're going to back me up on something I've been telling the learners. So right. Patricia says, well, you know what, Stuart, you've been telling me that I should reach for JavaScript last. But when I see job descriptions, they're saying, oh, well. And you know what? Um, MT is like, not only that, but in these junior jobs, you'll see needs five years of React and needs, maybe they need to be good at this web app for photos. Can I, can I sort of condense this into a question, which is folks who are hiring for junior web developer uh, roles, should they also be, re are the job applicants wrong or are people hiring badly? Okay, so I entirely agree with you that the things that I'm saying may not necessarily dovetail particularly well with the jobs that people are advertising. Um, in this, everyone hiring jobs is 100% wrong. Everyone attempting to get jobs um, is correct. You do, you should not need this. Unfortunately, um, a whole bunch of people who are hiring managers are not as enlightened as they should be. And, you know, sorry, um, I wish I could fix it. Anytime you run into a hiring manager where they say, okay, we, we build websites for restaurants where you want to go to the restaurant and see what time they open, what time they close and what the menu is. And what we need is five years of React. You should throw a water balloon at that person and then tell them <laughs> I said to do it. But um, I, yes, I don't know how to fix it. I'm very conscious of the distinction here that I'm advising yeah. you to learn a set of skills which will potentially make it more difficult for you to get a job. Whereas what you do is say, well, I'm just going to cave in and learn React because that's what people are asking for. Even if it's not the best way to build the web, then I'll do that. And yeah, you know, got to pay the mortgage. I get that. <laughs> um, yeah. At that point, it becomes much like philosophical discussions about the kind of work you will do in general. You know, I mean, it's, and everyone draws that line for themselves in different places. Some people wouldn't work for power companies or tobacco companies or something along those lines um, because they'd say, no, I don't want to contribute to that. Um, some people say, well, you know, you've got to do the job. Um, and what I'll do is I'll dedicate myself in other ways or maybe I won't. And I'll just, you know, get the job and then read books. I'm allowed. <laughs> right? You're not the boss of me. Um, and that's fine. Um this is something which plays into that. This is my opinion on how the web should be built. And honestly, it's the people who design the web's opinion on the way the web should be built. And I've attempted to provide you reasons. This is not just Stuart thinks this, and therefore you should obey, although Stuart does this, think this, and you should obey. But <laughs> nonetheless, um, I have attempted to give some reasons, and you should um, uh, read for yourself as well. Cool. And Stuart, you've been building for the web, and, and I don't mean to appeal to authority, but you've been building for the web. Your your um... 60, 67, 68 years old? Shut up. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but not, not, not. I, I, not, I feel like I first bought it, I was 46, less than a week ago. Well, so. it, you look wonderful for it. Thank you. Um, sorry, Ramon and I have a sort of good cop, bad cop thing where I'm mean to the learners <laughs> all the time and he's just, uh, but you've been, and not, not that I'm just calling you old, uh, but you've been building for the web for an extensive amount of time, right? Yes, long time. Um, um, and it's reasonable to assume probably much longer than most hiring managers. I would have thought so. The first website I built was at university, which was in 1994. You built your first website two years before me, but I bet mine was way more pink and cute. Mine had like skulls around the outside. It was the worst. 
Mm. It, it's the, it, it, it's in the um it's in the wayback machine, but I'm not telling you where. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, it's you know, it's it's too bad I don't know your full name and where you went to university. Guess I'm never to find that. Give it a try, but yes, this is um. I, 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 I'm terribly sorry. I forgot. No, no. Um, I've, we've I've got a name, we've got a, a proper good question, and Maria is one of our learners. And re- Maria, I hope I don't make you feel bad, but just absolutely brilliant and so exciting. Mm-hmm. And Maria is saying, well, you know, CSS, uh, the interfaces with CSS and DOM manipulation, JavaScript. Is there a sort of career path where I don't need to worry much about the data handling part of JavaScript and still get to be a developer? Um. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 this um, this depends to some extent on what the definition of developer is. So, um, if you're working for a large organisation, they will often have a team of people, and some of those people will be uh, front end, some of them back end, some of them will be CSS, some of them will be um, writing the HTML, a bunch of them will be JavaScript people, and you can go down the route of CSS expert. Um, if you want to, and that's one approach to doing it. Almost no one has someone who just writes HTML and doesn't do anything else. It would be nice if they did, but basically <laughs> no one is that enlightened. There are limits. Um, um, but a second approach is to um, try to work for people who don't necessarily need the JavaScript stuff. If, you, um, if you're working for uh, a semi-large enterprise or an agency who who build React websites or view websites or whatever, and you're a front-end person rather than a back-end person, then there will likely be a bunch of JavaScript involved. And unless you're part of the design team or you're pure CSS, you will probably be expected to do a bunch of JavaScript stuff. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to do that at all, then it may be a good idea to look for industries where they do a lot of rendering things on the web but they're not doing a lot of interactivity. So you're not building web apps at all. You're building websites. Um, So uh, I know a whole whole bunch of people who do a lot of work with WordPress, for example, where they're doing, uh, obviously some of this is back-end work, but they're also doing site design and display, but they're not really doing very much interactive stuff because these things are not applications. It's not something where you might replace it with a native application. So I don't know. Um, I doesn't feel as helpful as I wanted to be. <laughs> I'd love to share a little bit of, of insight from my experience as a freelancer, if I may. Oh, do please, yes. Um, where I've been given um, essentially um, either PDF or PSD files, you know, Photoshop files uh, from a designer that says, "Here, please take this design and turn it into a static website." Where my job has been to, I would say, ninety percent make this, this was like a landing site for, for, for a, a Mac OS application. And my job was there to just turn that into H, take, turn, take that design and turn it into HTML and CSS with a little bit of JavaScript sprinkled in. This was me doing it on my own for things like, you know, sending emails, uh, sending uh, um, uh, support emails and that sort of thing. So I think it is possible. I also have done pure websites for, for clients as well. So depending on where you go about it, it's totally, it, it's, 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 I think it's not impossible to find stuff to yeah. do in just HTML and CSS. A lot of agency work, as you say, and things like that are yeah. um, oriented around this kind of almost static website where you don't, I, I mentioned a restaurant website earlier, but you don't need lots of interactivity on a website. I mean, lots of restaurants seem to think that you want interactivity, but what I want to know is what time do you open and what's on the menu and possibly where is the restaurant? And mm-hmm. delivery, please. Like, if you have delivery, just give me a heads up. Go to a restaurant. (laughs) And if it it were possible, reservations as well. Oh, you know, this is becoming a web app quite quickly, isn't it? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Or an HTML form. Well, exactly. Uh, So, uh, oh, lots more questions. Um, Yeah. So... Oh, gosh. Just, oh god go ahead sorry oh heck yeah. oh so <laughs> sorry we're, we're just oh. crashing a is saying well you know what and can you explain a little bit about if it's not a bother what a pw what is a progressive web app for learners who mm-hmm. haven't heard of that and oh could this be sort of all the nice things about an app and all the good things about the web yes 
uh, and that is a perfectly reasonable thing to ask. So a um, oh, I've, I've lost a bit. There we are. Um, so a PWA is essentially an app delivered over the web. So yes, it's a web app. Um, do I think they're a good idea? Yes, I do. For for something where you have the choice, where you would de deliver it as a native app normally to a phone, you could instead deliver that over the web. Now, if you're doing that, this is like the Photoshop thing I mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of the caveats about don't rely on your JavaScript don't really apply if what you're doing is building Photoshop because you have to. Um, most of the applications on your phone could be built with web technologies and delivered over the web. And that's what being a PWA essentially is. It's a way of building a thing, which a, a web app, which is available offline, is available cross-platform. You can push updates to it whenever you want. Um, you can send push notifications, so on and so forth. Um, I think they're a great idea. I'm fully in support of using web technologies rather than uh, platform native technologies wherever you can. Can we can we zoom out a little bit? Sorry, so when we yes. talk about no 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 this is marvelous. I'm just trying to yeah. be mean. When we talk about a native app, for for folks who haven't encountered these terms before, that's going to be like the ones you go to the um, the app store or the the Play Google Store, yeah, um, and download a little tiny program an app. Whereas what you're talking about is a website that you can effectively bookmark to your 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 phone's home screen, and it can send you notif it can effectively act like a native app mm. but it's zippy and web like is that is that where we're at well yes there's um there's no real distinction between a a website delivered over the web with web technologies that you've added to the home screen on your phone or to the launcher on your desktop um which happens to um be a web page under the covers and one which happens to not be a web page under the covers. Mm -hmm. So uh, to give you a few examples, uh, if any of you have used um, Discord or um, Slack. They have used Discord. Or, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, then these are apps, uh, these are desktop applications. So uh, I'm thinking about a desktop version here rather than a phone version. Um, but these are desktop applications built using a technology called Electron, which is essentially a web browser inside an application. So it's all built with web technologies. Um, Slack and Discord in particular, you can go and use them in the web browser. You can just go to discord.app slash whatever, um, or you can install their application, but their application is just a web browser, basically. It doesn't tell you that it's a web browser, but that's what it is. Now, these aren't quite PWAs. There's quite a lot of blurred lines here between what is a website in the web browser, what is a website which you can bookmark to your home screen, what is a an application you install from the App Store or from the Play Store, which is really just a web browser under the covers, um, what is a an app which is not using web technologies but use bits of web technologies inside it. So there is no clear dividing line here. But I am in general of the opinion that a PWA is delivered over the web. You didn't need to install it. You just... Um, you go to it in a browser and you can add it to your home screen. So those of you, um, the latest craze sweeping at least some of the web is, or at least it was a couple of weeks ago, is a thing called Wordle, which is a very simple little um, word game that lots and lots of people have played. That's just a web page. Um, it's not an app. You don't need to install it from the store. And to be clear, you shouldn't install it from the store. And if you see it in the store, it's because someone's stolen it. Um, <laughs> but you can just you just go to that web page. You can play it every day. Millions of people seem to be doing so until the New York Times have just bought it for seven figures. That is, um, it is installable to your home screen. Um, it remembers uh, the things you've played already. Every time you go back to it, it doesn't present itself as though it's a web page, but it is. It's built entirely on the web. It's available on every platform. It didn't need approval. It didn't need to be reviewed by anyone um, to get into a store. Anyone who has a link to it can go and play it. That's a PWA. That's the power of delivering applications over the web. And it's a great idea. Stuart. Thank you. Are you ready for <laughs> some spicy opinion time? Do it. Yeah. Stuart, 
Where 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 will we start? Let's. Is everybody going to eventually have to be a full stack of developer eventually? Like, is just front end going to be a job in the near future, or is all that going to go away? And this is, of course, please look into the future for us. But <laughs> top top, that's what you get for showing up as a guest. Now, to be clear, this question does not say what do I want to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, wh what I think is, if they make me emperor, which is going to happen at some point, hopefully. <laughs> I um, mean, with I do not yeah. think everyone should have to go full stack eventually. I think the idea that anyone can be fully competent all the way from the back end all the way to the front end is laughable. Um, it is a full time job and a full life career to be really good just at CSS. Right, let alone everything else you need to do. Um, I would probably call myself a to the extent that I'm a developer at all rather than consultant or author or whatever. I'd probably call myself a full stack developer because I can do all of it, and on some projects, I do do all of it. But on, at any given point, anywhere on that list. I can point to people who are better than me at it and almost almost they're better than me at it because they do that thing and don't do the rest of it. Um, and therefore, I think the ex to the extent that companies and project providers and funders are requiring developers to learn a bunch of technologies outside what they knew before, to become full-stack developers rather than front-end only, I believe that is a bad trend. However, a whole bunch of companies want everyone to do it because, you know, when all you've got is a full stack hammer, everyone looks like a nail, I suppose. it's This is going to sound like me picking on you, which is familiar because my voice yeah. always sounds yeah. like me picking on you. But I want to go back to, because you did this so effortlessly, and I want all of my learners to steal this from you, where you're like, Oh, you know, as a developer, oh, if I could be considered developer, I guess I'm more of a consultant or an author. That was such a laid back, very, very modest way to list off some very impressive stuff. Can we get you to come back and teach a master class in being very casually confident? Um, okay. Oh, I, don't I guess know. not. I, I, I don't know that I could teach it, goodness. Um, oh, gosh, I thought you were just like giving it all up and you were like, oh, no, I'm born into it. You ready for more uh, opinion stuff? I, 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 oh. I, I wish I were that slick. <laughs> Are website builders like WordPress taking away creativity from the web? I mean, theoretically, in the same way that calculators uh, take away skill from mathematicians because they don't know how to do long division. Uh, these things are tools. Um, I... I could, and most full stack developers could build a website entirely from the ground up without need of a tool like WordPress. But the, the goal of a tool like WordPress is so you don't have to do that and you can get on yeah. with the other stuff. Because the point I kept trying to come back to during the talk is what matters is the experience of your users. Um, user experience is uh, the people who are looking at the site you're building, did they find out what they wanted to know with a minimum of fuss? Did they go away happy? Um, there is a pervasive tendency among our industry to confuse UX, user experience, with DX, developer experience, mm. by saying, if, it, if it's easier for me to build a website, that must, by definition, make for better websites. And I don't, I, I mean... That might be the truth, but it's certainly not guaranteed. Yeah. Um, and so you can be pretty creative with WordPress anyway, but the idea that tools take away your creativity. I mean, if you went to talk to Michelangelo and said, okay, I need you to make statues, um, and all I'm going to give you That's literally what happened, chisel. though, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, Art history-wise, the Pope came up to be like, hey, man, great great statues you want to paint yeah but the point is what they if they'd have said okay you only get this one type of chisel he'd still have been a lot better at statues than me <laughs> um, but the tools don't constrain your creativity ideally they would augment it they would add to it um the problem like for that. me with the problem for me with tools comes when they do constrain you because they 
they don't allow you to do certain things and you have no way of not using the tool. Tools are a problem when you're locked into them and they're not fully competent. Almost no tool is fully competent, almost by definition. There will always be things you want to do that the tool can't use, the, the tool can't manage. But that's not a problem as long as you're not required to use the tool. If the only way you have of building websites is WordPress, or the only way you are permitted to build a website is WordPress, or is wix or is squarespace or whatever and you want to do a thing and they're like no nope, you're not allowed to do that we're going to prohibit it we could allow it but we're not going to then you have a problem yeah. but the very fact that a tool can't do a thing is not in itself constraining unless you are constrained to only use the tool so i do want to jump in really quickly with again a comment uh Lanzi is saying, oh, I work at Shopify, and Shopify is a big, fancy, proper company. And it's like, oh, most of the code I do is in HTML and CSS. Nice. That's really good to hear. <laughs> so we're going to do a bunch of very, very concise question and answer. Are you ready? I'd love uh, to you do concise questions. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna, go, go, I'm go, not go, go. concise answers, but go for it. Okay. I've noticed this. <laughs> ready? First one. So from MT, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. What is your definition of of the difference between a web developer and a software engineer? I don't know, probably about $20,000. I don't think Literally my answer where I was going to be like 12,000 <laughs> pounds. I don't, think there's um, a difference. I don't think there's a difference at all. They're just different names for the same thing. Um, you you call yourself a software engineer if you want a job in the enterprise where they go, ah, oh, but you've got to have this, um, these five years of this and Prince 2 qualifications and this quality standard. But they're... They're the same thing. You're doing engineering, you're doing software engineering, you're doing web development, all the same. Ready? How do I showcase and prepare to be a React developer? No, um, I I feel like maybe I didn't even do the talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you if if that's what you want to do, the React website itself is actually pretty good at onboarding people to understand how to. Um, develop React, develop React components, and get started. I personally would, um, if you're doing this in order to to give yourself the skills, to train yourself, to have the skills to start applying for jobs or to start building private projects of your own, then I would pick a project in your head and attempt to build it. Um, something that you don't necessarily have to show anybody else. It doesn't need to have a real purpose outside something you want it for. But a private project can be useful beyond that you then want to think about how you're going to get jobs if what you're looking for is to become a react developer because it pays well or because you want jobs in it don't just think about the technology the um if you can say hey i can do this technology but also i understand how to relate to people how to how to work with other people here's demonstrations of what i understand about design um then all of that helps if what you've got is one string to your bow if you're uh, if you're a developer, you're applying to be a developer, and your skill is, I know how to do development, and I know how to do development in React, and that's it, it may help you get jobs, but the other stuff is more useful. Agreed. I love that answer. So, all right, next one. we got one from Joanna. Hello, Stuart. What would be the best advice to give us if uh, that you'd wished you had when you were starting your career? Buy Apple shares. Um, I... <laughs> You got mad um, when I made fun of you for being old, but like, you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because that wouldn't have applied to all of our learners. They're like in their 20s. They're babies. They're, oh, it's, um, you see, they're the young prob faces. The Ugh. problem is there, what I could have said there is buy and then some other stuff which has gone rapidly up in price. But I'm not even as a joke going to suggest <laughs> this. Um, those of you who aren't sure what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. I will not rob you of your precious. It's goodness. not going to be around in five years. It's fine. Actual, okay, advice um, that I wish I had when I was starting my career. So the stuff I said, um, the answer I gave to the previous question about how being a good developer is about more than knowing how to type things into a text editor is something that I learned the hard way. Um, that the skill of being able to relate to other people, um, to work with other people is harder and way more important than development skill if i think i believe i'm not 100 percent sure about this um but i think i believe that there are some people who just aren't geared up for doing software development and some people who are there's a switch in people's heads it's like 
I don't know, the priesthood or something. Um, you've got a calling for it or you haven't, I believe. I'm, as I say, I'm not 100% sure about this point, but spot me that that's the case for one moment. Given that, if you can do programming at all, training yourself in different programming skills, at least to a basic level, is not that hard. Um, if you know one language, learning the second one is okay. Um, if you are, you know, uh, your, if your first programming language is HTML and then uh, you want to learn a bit about CSS, great. Uh, becoming an expert in lots of different things is hard. Um, but learning the next thing is not that complicated, in my opinion. But learning to relate to other people, how to work well in a team, how to gel a team together is it's an undervalued skill and it's way more important to having a life which is both successful and happy from your point of view. The downside of this plan is an awful lot of companies don't rate the skill very highly because a lot of them don't even realize that they need it. Um, I don't know how to fix that. This is another when they make me emperor thing um, that you tell people, hey, you know what? Employ people who don't cause waves. Employ people who don't start fights. It doesn't matter how good they are at the technology. If you've got people who make everyone's life difficult, don't hire them. And that stuff I've learned through working with loads and loads, loads of different teams and on different projects and in different environments and so on, that that's more important. The actual programming ability is um less critical than a team who are able to work efficiently together I, be, oh sorry. sorry oh no I let's effusively agree with stuart for a I, minute furiously nodding along like this is something that we've been saying a lot in the javascript bootcamp it's that ability to communicate your ideas to 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 to, to articulate them that really helps unlock that I'm with you 100%. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Ramon, if you were to answer the same question, so what advice do you wish you had gotten early on? What would you say? Hmm. Oh, now you've put me on the spot. <laughs> Consistently. Because <laughs> the next question is actually somebody else helping me being mean to Stuart again. So I wanted a little bit of a buffer. Well, um, if I could go back, and this is something is, is to, I think I would go for ask. I would encourage myself to ask for help earlier than I usually do. Speaking on communication, I found myself, I used to, I, I used to tend err on the side of asking, waiting far too long, being stuck in a problem before reaching out for help or advice. And I wish I'd done so sooner so as to save both my team and myself and the problem, the project, the time. Y'all are real nice. My advice to my past self is mean where I'm like, Hey, a lot of times, especially when you're trying to get into your first job in tech, that question, is it me or is everyone bad at hiring, comes up again and again and again. And the advice I would bring to my baby self is, hey, it's cool. Everyone's bad at hiring. That's good, too. Stuart, if someone were a person of a certain age and trying to get into programming for the first time, do you have any advice for them that's different or any encouragement that's that's specific? I should add, Ooh. I'm reasonably aged as well, and I got in when I was grown. Uh, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, oh. I Okay, so uh, those of us who, um, who are rich in years will... <laughs> um, uh, you will have come to this industry from something else. <clears throat> and so what I would suggest is play on the fact that you have other skills because they are what set you apart from everybody else. Um, honestly, I imagine uh, it's going to be hard because hiring managers and companies in general are weird about hiring someone who's 40 for a junior position. Um, I mean, maybe they shouldn't be, but I can't fix that. Um, so... It, it does feel strange to put someone um, uh, middle-aged, subordinate to someone significantly younger than them. And 
I would gear up for the fact that you need to be prepared to deal with that. It would feel strange to me if I went into another industry, nothing to do with tech, and I was suddenly subordinate to people half my age, I think I'd have a bit of a hard time dealing with that. And so I'd have to gear up to deal with that. But I would... One of the things that semi-senior people tend to think about juniors is that um, they they can get the work done, no problem, but you're allowed to dismiss their ideas because they don't really have the experience to back them up. Um, and that's not a right way to think, and I wish people would pack it in, but they do think it. <laughs> um, if you're coming in at middle age, that's something where that ageist bias actually works for you. The people will, I suspect, assume that your ideas are slightly better than they might otherwise be because it looks like you've got the experience, even if you may not actually have. Um, this is, you know, sort of practical advice rather than nice advice, but it might be worth playing that kind of thing up. But yeah, I'm, I don't know if any of that's very helpful because I don't really know the answer to that question, Carlos. It's a, it's a good question. And... I'd be really interested in um, what else you dig up about that and how you approach it and fingers crossed for you. Really appreciate the, the honesty there. I think, you know, not, not having the answer is also something we need to be upfront about not having the full answer. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Stuart, you've been so kind and generous to us with your time and I want to be conscious of that. And let's do one more question and then let's go and get some rest. It's been a full day. And <laughs> I'm going to go with this question from Catherine Another opinion question. How about everybody telling you that you have to create content to stick out in the dev world, i.e. blogging, tweeting a lot, streaming, etc.? This is a good question. Um, if everyone is telling you they have to create content to stick out in the dev world, they are correct. Um, uh, th there is a question about whether you want to stick out in the dev world, whether that's actually a good idea or an annoying, pointless waste of your time. And this is something which has changed over my life a bit because I get to be a bit blase about this because I'm less worried about people finding out about things that I'm doing now because a bunch of people already know, right? So this is just me being smug from atop the mountain, which is not at all helpful. But I wrote a book and I did loads and loads of conference talks and I did things in order to get my name out there. And the reason you do that is because um, it helps get you jobs, whether you're working for yourself or um, if you're working for other people, it, it helps to elevate your profile. It gets you noticed. And honestly, it's nice when people talk about you most of the time. Um, and all of those are reasonable things to want. And if you want to stand out, you do have to make things. Um, you have to do things to get you noticed. Now, it is terribly easy to take the celebrity route of doing things because they get you noticed rather than because they are good things to do. Um, and I personally think you shouldn't do that. But then, you know, loads of people are loads more famous than me. And whether you think they're doing it for self-aggrandizing reasons to get famous or not is kind of up to you and <laughs> how you view these things. Um, I love I that very gentle, like, you could try and get famous online. I love that because you didn't quite say but why, but... Well, that's kind of... There are, as I say, there are good reasons to do it. Um, it does help you get new jobs. It does help you get noticed. Um, uh, it, do, it, it does help you not only get new jobs, but better jobs. Um, yeah. That you will be picked ahead of other people who may be just as um, competent, um, just as good at the job as you, because you have a, a more visible profile. There are reasons to do this. And like I say, it is cool when people talk about you, right? And anyone who, who lies and says, no, 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 I'm not in it for that. I'm just in it to do good for the world is just, just, just don't listen. Um, but um, if you want to do that, you have to do things that will get you noticed. Um, drawing your own personal ethical line about how much you're prepared to do stuff. Um, wait, 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 wait. Because it gets you noticed rather than just because it's the right thing to do is up to you individually. But I will say this. Um, you may have heard the phrase about building a better mousetrap, where if you just do, if you just make a great thing, the world will beat a path to your door. They won't. It would be lovely to believe the world works like that, but it does not. You have to do at least a little bit of 
advertising, marketing of yourself. These are not wrong things to do. They are not wrong ways to think. And don't feel guilty about doing it because all the people who you think aren't doing it and are famous anyway are doing it. They're just that good at it that you can't even tell they're doing it. Um, yeah, Ramon. Where <laughs> where you where you draw the line? Um, how much you're prepared to do before you personally yourself feel I can't bear this any longer is up to you. But you got to do some of it. And seriously, everyone else is doing it too. Um, so the, sk- the skill is to be so good <laughs> at marketing yourself that people don't even think you're marketing yourself. I am I... not that good. At it. <laughs> I know we promised we were going to set you free, but you you used a phrase in answering that that I want to stop and examine a little bit more. And it's fine. This isn't a ha 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 thing. I um, I asked you on here because I wanted your help radicalizing our learners. Uh, and you use the phrase personal ethical line. Do you find as a developer, or I might even suggest as somebody in the wider world, that having a pre-established sort of spiky, sort of almost calcified ethical framework as you approach developer work is that important is that necessary i find it important it's not necessary i don't think but um well the reason i find it important and the reason it's probably necessary for me myself is that if i decided to evaluate everything on its merits at the time without having a bunch of pre-baked ethical rules i think i'd find it way too easy to just make exceptions all the time at which point that's the same thing as not having any ethical rules you can fool yourself in thinking no no this is an exception but if they're all exceptions i i I have ethical rules for the same reason that i don't buy cookies for to keep them in the flat right this is my apartment here i don't have cookies here because what happens is if i have them i'll just sit there and for lunch i'll think oh i'll just have a cookie and then it turns out that i just eat 12 cookies and then i'm not hungry and then i think okay what this means is that today for lunch i had a packet of biscuits that's not a good idea and so rule just don't buy them so um having pre-baked rules for me helps because it means that i'm i'm not as vulnerable to just violating all the rules because i think this time is unusual when it isn't someone who was more morally secure than me (laughs) maybe would be able to do that um would be able to evaluate each thing on its merits and then say no i'm I'm definitely going to stick to the rule this time i just I think I'm good enough for that. Oh, gosh, I've never stopped to think about this. Like, are there people who walk amongst us who were just born into the world, ethically able to withstand really the the very practical temptations? I I don't know. I ain't met them. I, I, I suspect there are a lot of people, there are a lot more people who would claim to be like that than who are actually like that. Um, Whether I think that it's, logically impossible for such a person to exist is probably a bit of a rage, but yeah, I'm prepared to bet there aren't many. <laughs> I think it's important to remember we're human and, you know, things yeah. change over time. Uh, and and we learn, we learn things as things emerge over time. I, Thank you both so much. This has been an absolute delight. Shall I let both of you go to hopefully have a really easy evening? Uh, Ramon, your learners, what's their homework? Oh, yes, yes. We kind of left in a rush. But um, so the <laughs> homework is to finish the rest uh, for the JavaScript bootcamp is to finish the rest of the basic algorithms uh, section in Free Code Camp, which we got about 50, 48, 5-ish percent of the way through. Oh, you're nicer than me. I get them like 20% of the way and I'm like, y'all have a good day. Good, good luck with CSS. They've been helping me today. It's been wonderful. <sighs> They're the best. Um, and tomorrow we'll start up with uh, object-oriented programming. If How you're you in just... my class, go ahead and try and finish those CSS buildings where we're learning CSS variables, which is a concept that's going to have a lot of transference into JavaScript. Uh, Stuart, do you have any homework for our learners? Oh, goodness, no. Um, <laughs> it, does, it, it sounds like you've got enough from other people. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Carry on, carry on learning. Honestly, th- th- um, 
you don't need homework for me other than give yourself a pat on the back for doing this. Because this is really cool. Ramon, say it, say it, do it. Pat, pat. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. We'll let you go. And all of you, please have the easiest possible rest of your day. Or if it's nighttime, you got to have a chill day tomorrow. Bye, my love.